Hey guys, this is Mike Mahaffey, the old bastard BJJ guy, here for BJJ Mental Models. Back in my day, we had to walk uphill in the snow both ways to get to the academy just to learn some crappy technique from a random purple belt. You kids have it so easy, because now you can just subscribe to BJJ Mental Models Premium and get tons of great audio courses to learn new techniques, enhance your mindset, and entertain yourself. You can even get personalized rolling reviews from some of your favorite BJJ Mental Models coaches, including me. It's like having your own seminar, you spoiled little whippersnappers. So what are you waiting for? Subscribe to BJJ Mental Models Premium right now, get off my lawn, and go train. Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 280. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jiu-jitsu approach. And today, we're going international again because I am here with Giles Garcia. How's it going, Giles? Very well, Steve. Can't complain. Life is good and all is well with the world. I mean, it's not. Everything's a hell, it's a hellscape. But other than that, everything's great. It's a hellscape, but we're used to it. You don't laugh, you'll cry, Steve. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, you are very clearly not from the same country as me, my friend. Why don't you do a quick introduction and tell everyone about who you are? My name's Giles Garcia. I am from Scotland and Glasgow. However, I'm actually half Spanish as well because my father is from Tenerife, but my mother's from Scotland. I'm 37 years old, I think. And I've been doing martial arts for 31 years and I've been doing jiu-jitsu for 16 years of those years so yeah i'm pretty deep in at this point and it's too late to escape (laughs) that's basically the sunk cost fallacy gets you every time right you get in this deep and too late to switch to striking or judo or something at this point i mean i did do striking at one point and i did mma for a wee bit but then i realized i'm too pretty for that and i'm getting too old to get punched in the face repeatedly so that was that it's funny i was thinking about augmenting my stand-up game because i am you know i'm a filthy guard pulling butt scooter and i thought you know at some point i should probably focus on this and i was thinking about getting back into judo i hadn't explicitly trained judo in some time and i was asking i think it was stefan kesting and i said i should get into this because he used to do judo and he said steve you're just way too old for this shit now (laughs) the window was passed if you try to start judo post 40 you're just gonna die it's not a good idea (laughs) I uh, know. Well, I'm quite lucky. Um, we've got a good uh, wrestling coach at the club. He's been superb making wrestling applicable to jiu-jitsu and also making caveats for people who are a little bit older and, you know, for people like me who've got an awful lot of mileage on the clock. So um, having a good coach who realises that you're perhaps, you know, you're, you don't bounce back from injuries that well anymore is invaluable i'd say certainly he's worked wonders for me so far i've not crippled myself wrestling yet i think so so far so good nice nice well tell me a little bit about your training i mean what do things look like over there i assume it's basically the same as jiu-jitsu here in canada except i guess you you likely wear kilts right instead of spats is that the only difference (laughs) oh oh, oh, no (laughs) no no uh, just to break down any common misconceptions it's the the movie Braveheart is not a true and accurate historical representation of Scotland. For starters, Mel Gibson is Australian, and his accent in that movie was horrific. I I die of secondhand embarrassment every single time I hear it. We don't wear kilts. Sorry to burst anyone's fantasies. We will usually wear a few layers because it's usually absolutely freezing. And then again, much like yourselves, it's probably absolutely Baltic over there too. And to get into the meat of it. I would say that the training has made quite a shift, especially in the kind of central belt, you know, the kind of the major towns like Glasgow and Edinburgh and all that. It's quite interesting to see, and this will kind of lead into what we're going to talk about later, I think, Steve. In the past year or so, particularly, you've seen a real increase in the standard of teaching. There's a lot of people at different clubs who've really upped their game one of the things I would say about jiu-jitsu is that jiu-jitsu teaching wise is still a bit behind other sports. So more established sports like, say, for example, uh, uh, football or what you would call soccer, I suppose, American football, rugby, all these sports are much more advanced in terms of coaching, the, the skills you need to have in order to be a coach. If and from the, how you drill, how you teach your students to how you talk to your students and your star athletes and all the rest of it. However, I would say in Glasgow, there's been a few clubs that 
I keep an eye on and the level has increased. And certainly in terms of how we operate at our own club, myself and other coaches had a, like internal discussions about how we teach our students better or what method do we use, how do we approach it, you know, the whole kind of concepts and principles versus systems things, all that sort of things. And I suppose if I was to name that which should not be named the ecological approach, Steve, I know yes. that's... Uh, <laughs> I, I know it's a hot button topic and it pisses off many corners of the internet but there is a, a use to everything I would say and hopefully by the end of this podcast I will not have half of Reddit trying to kick down my door and dox me uh, that would be useful <laughs> well that's kind of what Reddit is for I think honestly right that's their main skill set is just fucking up people's lives and posting misinformation. But anyway, enough about our friends on Reddit. You had some great points, though. You were talking about this move towards more advanced, more thoughtful coaching methods, and also this move towards more systemized thinking in jujitsu. That's ultimately what led to the creation of BJJ mental models was just the realization that these things are easier to learn and understand if they're systemized. So most of our work has been trying to come up with and present ideas that make jujitsu easier for grapplers of all levels. And I would definitely want to explore from your standpoint, what experiences you've had there, what your findings have been on this journey as you've moved away from, I guess, what you would call the traditional coaching style and what you've added on and what kind of results you've seen from your students by doing so. Yeah. So I suppose I should probably start with a little bit of the background I've had in terms of me learning and also a few, a few kind of key moments which made me realize, shit, I've been doing everything wrong or I'm learning the wrong way. And including that moment where I had 30 minutes of sheer terror and I wanted to quit jiu-jitsu and run away from my life and go live in the woods, which was actually quite character building, apart from the pant-shitting terror I experienced. So I started off obviously martial arts. I did karate for about 12 years since I was a kid. Then I did other stuff like Wing Chun, Ninjutsu and all that. And I realized that Ninjutsu does not work. And so I was used to quite archaic methods of learning. And then when I first started Jiu-Jitsu, the way it was taught was, okay, here's a technique. You are going to do, you're going to do close guard. You're going to try this arm bar and you're going to try this triangle. And you're going to do three moves. You have five minutes to draw them, go. And then we'd come back. And straight from the off, I realized that method was not working in any way, shape, or form. Mostly because I had the higher belts, like blue belts and the purple belts, basically can I get a hold of me and say, Giles, like, maybe you're simple, maybe the coaching style doesn't work for you, but here's how you actually do it. They would correct me and fix me, and I would learn through osmosis. And that never sat right with me. I thought to myself, that, that surely can't be right. And then I would also did Jeet Kune Do as well for a while. I used to go to seminars and all that. And I remember one time at a seminar seeing, you know, everyone was drilling kicks and blocks and punches. And I remember looking around and seeing everyone doing the exact same technique, the exact same way, all different shapes and sizes and different temperaments and different ages. And yet they were all, it was a cookie cutter. And I remember turning to my instructor at the time and saying, Steve, sorry, my instructor's name is Steve, not you. You were not there at the time, Steve. Sorry, just to clarify. Are you sure I wasn't there? My memory's <laughs> not very good, man. It could have been me for all I know. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I have been hitting the head quite a lot of times, so it's very possible, Steve. Who knows? <laughs> but I, uh, I remember looking around and thinking, shit, this is not right. This is not how it's meant to be. And so... Ever since that point, that was about 14 years ago, I said to my instructor, I'm going to try and figure out a way to make it so that jiu-jitsu is easier to learn. I said, I'm going to build some sort of database or I'm going to find some way of connecting it all together so it makes sense. It's like when you've got a big puzzle and you start off with a corner and the edge pieces and you go, okay, I've got a structure to work with. I can figure this out, you know, unless you lose a piece. At that point, you're fucked. But that was a formative experience. And then fast forward to a blue belt tournament I did where I knew very little and I was capable of even less. But I remember sweeping someone in a tournament and it was no sweep I'd ever been shown in my life. But it just made intuitive sense. So just picture a scenario. I've got the guy in close guard. I've got this terrible scissor sweep attempt on the go one way. And then I realized, okay, he's blocking. 
but he shifted his weight that way. Oh wait, I've still got his hand. He can't post with his arm. Can I like chop his... I've swept in the other way. It's like, I can't... And I was sweeping him to my right side, which is something I don't do. Or, well, I didn't do at the time. And then afterwards, I came off the mat, I'd won the match, and I was like, hold on a second. I just did that intuitively. Why did I do that? And then as time went on, I kind of figured out, okay, it's because I just inherently knew if he couldn't stop himself from falling in his face and I made him fall that way, well, that's a fucking sweep, isn't it? That's simple. And then fast forward again to 2015, the BGG Globetrotters camp in Italy in Sardinia with Christian Graugart. He did a class and will stay with me to the day I die, Steve. Um, till my dying breath, I will tell whoever listens about this class because Christian talked about this thing called the super string theory of jiu-jitsu and essentially he was talking about the basic principle of what you're trying to do in jiu-jitsu. So essentially, if you're in the bottom defending, you're trying to stop someone from getting into the space between your knees and your elbows. So you're trying to shut them out and put stuff in the way. Conversely, if you're the person top, you're trying to remove those barriers and put some part of your anatomy, be it your knee, your chest, your head, whatever, into that space. And within the space of that one class, my open guard game, it went from being absolute dog shit to slightly mediocre. So, you know, it was, those were important formative moments where I realized that in order for me to kind of grasp jujitsu and for it to make sense to anyone, you've got to understand the whys of how it works, but you've also got to make it easy for people to see the whys. You've got to have them have that aha moment. Kind of like the Matrix. You know, you can't tell them what it is. You've got to show them. Am I making sense so far, Steve? Please say yes. <laughs> Absolutely. And your experiences very much parallel mine, right down to formative conversations with Christian Graugard, actually. One of my favorite episodes that we ever did was an episode we did with him way back in the day. And he talked about uh, the process of creating. And it was just a really interesting chat, very much changed the attack plan I had for things like BJJ mental models and how we make this stuff. So definitely recommend studying Christian stuff. He's a really interesting guy. And of course, uh, his contributions to the sport of jiu-jitsu just can't be overstated. I mean, between having a, a legitimate competitor to IBJJF's belt ranking system to the creation of BJJ Globetrotters, he's done some great stuff. So definitely a fan of his and a friend of his. That said, though, my experience very much parallels yours. I came into jiu-jitsu, like so many people, thinking that what my instructors were doing was the optimal way to learn this stuff. I just assumed it would be. I didn't realize that you know, when I'm a white belt, I'm not thinking that my instructors are really just in the same boat that I am. They've just been in this boat longer. They're as confused as the rest of us. And the methods that they were using, the traditional class approach where, you know, you come in, there's some sort of warm up, often has nothing to do with jujitsu. Then they give you three techniques and you drill them silently against a non-resisting opponent. And then you just do a bunch of open sparring, right? I've called that the three-part class structure that you see so commonly in many jujitsu gyms to this day. And I just assumed because all of the instructors I knew were doing it that way, that that must be the best way to do things. But reflecting back on my journey now, all of the big breakthrough moments I've had have come from self-application and self-experimentation, like you said, realizing that doing things the way that my instructor taught me is not really the goal. And in fact, it might not even work a lot of the time. There, just because your instructor does something a certain way doesn't mean it's going to work for you to do it that same way. So it was a big revelation for me that thinking more in terms of concepts like you discussed there about uh, basically taking their elbow knee space, right? We've talked about this on the podcast before. What is a guard pass? Ultimately, it's not moving from guard to side control necessarily. What a guard pass is, is when you get past the person's legs and then you cut their body in half. You put something like a wedge. Usually it's going to be a part of your body, like your hand or your hip or your knee, you put that in between your opponent's elbow and knee space so that they cannot close that space. Basically, that's a guard pass. You're cutting the person in half. And if you look at all of the dominant positions in jiu-jitsu, like mount, knee on belly, side control, even back control, the way that these work, you're basically putting something in that elbow knee space to cut the person's body in half. So like you, I realized, well, if I'm getting my guard passed, all I have to do is never let the person get inside that space. 
And that changed my game overnight. I mean, that was such a breakthrough for me realizing that I'd spent years trying to memorize all of these specific guard retention techniques. I could never make them work because I could never predict what my opponent was going to do. And I always felt like I must suck at this sport. I must be deficient at it because I just don't understand it. They keep telling me this and I hear what they're saying, but I can't do it. And so I assumed I was just bad, but actually I was just overcomplicating things. When I focused on simplifying, it meant there was less crap in my brain going on at any given time so I could make better decisions faster. And that's ultimately why when I I teach now and when I talk on this podcast, I try to avoid getting too into the reads about put your left foot here, put your right arm here, because so much of the time, that's just a variable. It doesn't really matter. The most important thing are the concepts and the big ideas that tie everything together. So to get back to your question, what you're saying absolutely makes sense. It's the same journey that I've been on. And I'm going to guess if anyone's listening to this, probably the same journey they've been on too. Yeah. I mean, I would also add to that. Obviously, the concepts are really important. And I suppose if I was to use an analogy, I'm a massive fan of analogies, especially if they're a bit wild, a bit daft, and they stick in people's heads. I've had the privilege of teaching at a bunch of the BGG Globetrotters camps. And I usually try and make sure that people learn something, that they're not fucking bored to tears, and that they've put, got a bit of a sweat on. I think, you know, sweat, smile, and learning, those are the three main components you need to have a class. I always try and make sure they've got takeaways. And I use idioms and analogies and a fair amount of course language to kind of get it into their heads. I would say is that the main analogy I use is that concepts are like the kind of air currents. So you know when you're in an airport and, you know, you see it's windy. You don't really know it's windy until you see a windsock and you see the windsock flapping in the wind and then you start panicking because, you know, obviously you're going to have turbulence. I, this is relevant to me because I am shit scared of turbulence on a plane. But long story short, the analogy is that the air or the wind is like the concept or the principles, but the techniques illustrate the principles. You use the techniques like the scissor sweep, for example, to illustrate bringing someone off balance and removing posts. In that case, the wind is the principle or the concept and the windsock is the technique used to show it's there and show what's happening with it. Now, that's how I describe it. So the concepts are important, especially if you're initially learning and as you continue to learn throughout jiu-jitsu. However, I would say that systems are really important, especially once you get to the higher levels. I know some people are probably going to disagree with me, but I think, and just to clarify, when I say systems, I mean, for example, you have a set of attacks from something like collar and sleeve guard where you know, generally speaking, where your opponent's going to go, how they're going to try and counter, and you have a response, a sort of set response for all these sort of scenarios. I have heavily pinched this from John Thomas. I'm not going to try and pass off his... Um, his examples in my own but that really stuck with me and the way i see it that you need the principles and the concepts and you must understand the whys so you can learn but if you want to perform at the highest level especially you're doing adcc or the euros of the worlds you need systems you need to have a particular game that once you found your entry into it you can absolutely shithouse the other person that would be my sort of take on it i'm sure some people are probably you know, you're already grabbing pitchforks and torches right now to come and burn me out. But um, that's my take on it. I agree with you completely. People sometimes listen to talks like this, and I think they think that we're advocating ideas and concepts only. Techniques are dead, never do those. But I mean, that's not how it goes. Thinking in the big picture with concepts and thinking low level with techniques, these things marry well together and they complement each other. It actually is a risk to focus too much on the conceptual side of things because, and I know this is a very common problem with people like myself, it's easy to overanalyze jujitsu and get so focused on just trying to study things and turn it into like an academic exercise that you're not actually getting the physical reps in and doing the training. And this is where I think the ecological dynamic stuff is really helpful because it if done right, it can help people break out of that pattern because it gives them very specific games to work on. It, you can't really hide behind ideas and things when you're constantly playing these games and the rules are very, very simple. But I've definitely had this experience myself where I've thought about jujitsu so conceptually that sometimes you forget at the end of the day, this is a physical sport. You can train your mind as much as you want, but 
you also have to train your body too. And where I think these two things play in together is I have found that thinking conceptually helps me figure out what the best decision is on the spot if I don't already know the answer. I have found that it helps me see patterns in new moves, new systems, new techniques, and quickly understand how they work and also quickly assess whether they'll be a good fit for me or not. That's been a big thing that's really helped me with the conceptual side of things is if I know what my game looks like and what the main things I'm trying to achieve on the mat are, I can really quickly look at a technique and say, that's probably a really cool technique, but I don't know exactly how that's going to fit into my game directly. So if I want to integrate something like that, I can think in a more nuanced fashion about how I would do that and what I need to get there. An example that often comes up, I've talked about this before, um, another Giles, Lachlan Giles, he talks sometimes about how you got to make sure that the various guards you're playing chain together. Because if you don't have an easy way to travel from one guard to another guard, you can't really play those in a fluid fashion. So thinking about stuff like that has been very helpful in my journey. I think what you're saying is totally spot on. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, this is, I suppose this is the kind of thing that a lot of people are kind of wrestling with at the minute, I think, no pun intended. Obviously, you've got people talk about the ecological approach, like it's the second coming of Christ and it's going to solve all our problems. And you've got people saying, no, it's a terrible idea. You know, I'm not going to go over the arguments. It's been done a million times i'm sick and tired of it i would say that you they're all relevant tools so if i could just talk about how i teach and my sort of decision making process when i go to teach essentially i've got a 36 week plan that i set out and this is for myself and the five other coaches that teach in my gym and we have a kind of high level plan for the topics we're going to cover and how long we're going to teach each block for So we'll cover like closed guard, top and bottom, half guard, top and bottom, open guard, pins to submissions, chains and transitions, where we basically talk about how a lot of stuff connects together and, you know, emphasis on being able to, you know, if option A fails, option B, option C, option D, and just, you know, making sure your plan is adaptable because plans fail. And then on top of that, separate to that, we've got separate leg lock classes, which sit outside that plan and a separate standing grappling class. And those the overall plan is just there as a basic skeleton. And then within that, myself and all of our coaches, we all have different takes on it. But we all generally speaking agree we need people to, one, learn the ABCs of jiu-jitsu, especially if they're brand new. But also we need them to understand why stuff works. And then when it comes to actually teaching this, that's where the sort of real work begins. Because I essentially see it as this way. If I'm teaching, I have two choices depending on how much my time is limited. I can focus on showing them, being more prescriptive and saying, okay, we're going to work in this particular form of half guard here. Here's the attacks in here. This is how we're going to apply it with some positional sparring and all the rest of it. Or I can make them do certain drills and say, okay, so we're going to start off in this position here. You've got the basic guard here. You just know enough to get into the position and here's your parameters here's your end goal for both parties and let's go and let's see the chaos and then sort of debrief and kind of add detail on after that and i think you need both so for example there's gonna be times where i'll say okay i need everyone to kind of know how to use the overhook from half guard bottom i'll need them to know how to use the shield i need them to know a few basic attacks but also Essentially, I need them to have something to work with. And then the kind of the week after that, or say a recap week, I'll say, okay, you kind of know roughly what it's supposed to look like. Here's some parameters and let's see what comes out of the play, out of these drills. Here's the parameters I'm going to set. The game will end here or here. You know, so basically just ecological approach, if you want to call it that, or just positional sparring with caveats. I don't know. I'm not very good with names. And I think walking that fine balance between chaos or sort of uh, giving them free play but then giving them the detail when they need it that's the line that all coaches should be walking and it's down to the coach in the sort of moment in the week in the day in that in each minute of the class to kind of keep an eye on that and sort of change the plan depending on who's there is it the room for white belts do they not even know how to spell jujitsu you know, that's, that's supposed to challenge that all coaches face and it's a lot of hard work. 
But I think it, just to reiterate, it really is that balance between giving them the concepts and letting them play and have a bit of chaos, but then really sometimes having to go, no, here's the more efficient way to do things. You've stumbled upon the right answer here. Let me solidify that. Or, you know, you kept on getting absolutely shit housed here. Allow me to illuminate and give you an idea of what you should be doing. Here's a slightly better way that will probably work for everyone. Absolutely. You know, something we've talked about before on the show, I've called it this idea of learning incrementally as a coach. I always want to make sure that I am pushing students just a little bit outside of their comfort zone, but not too far. Because if you take someone who simply is too new at jujitsu to really understand what's going on, and you don't give them enough guidance then they're not going to get the maximal benefit out of the exercises and out of play because they just don't have enough context to know what's going on. So I always want to try to push them just one level above where they're currently sitting. Because the other problem too is you don't want people to kind of just sit where they're comfortable with and never try anything new. So managing the cognitive load on your students is kind of a gentle art that coaches need to keep in mind. Where this comes up a lot is black belts sometimes get very obsessive about making sure that every detail is communicated to the student perfectly. And that can really screw up a lot of new people because it feels like they're never doing anything right. They're maybe trying it an arm bar for the very first time in their lives. And they've got some black belt barking at them saying, no, your elbow is positioned one inch too far to the left, right? Little micro details that don't really matter in the grand scheme of things when you're just learning for the first time. So I think that layering on that complexity is an important thing that instructors need to think about. And that never really goes away. That applies to white belts just as well to black belts. You always want to be giving people just a little bit more than what they're comfortable with but not so much that they just get overwhelmed. Yeah, I mean, I've got to be honest, this is something I've had to develop over the years. I was really lucky when I was teaching kickboxing. My coach at the time sort of took me under his wing and he smacked me in the back of the head several thousand times. And He made sure I didn't turn into a complete fucking idiot. And he also made sure to remind me that a lot of people who are coming in are hobbyists. They have maybe a couple of nights a week to come and train and this is like their off time or their personal time they are spending what limited time and energy and money they have to come and listen to some idiot like me tell them jiu-jitsu so at that point i've learned to not get too hung up in the details so long as people get the general idea of what they're supposed to be doing i will not give them more details that's something that's been really hard for me to do but over the years i've learned you know what at the end of the day they've got the rough shape that'll do because any more than that it's just going to make everyone upset i've learned to let it go and not be a total perfectionist because that just kills people and on top of that i don't want to be i don't want to be giving someone trouble i don't want to be giving some desk jockey who's got like five kids and 10 dogs and has no sleep. I don't want to be giving him shit because he wasn't doing the perfect positioning on a heel hook or something like that or some complex technique. I'm not going to do that to him. I want him to actually enjoy what he's doing. And last time I checked, we're all participating in a really niche sport full of absolute fucking dorks. Why the fuck am I treating it like it's something actually important? You know, when it comes down to it, If civilization ends tomorrow, which it might, who's actually going to be important? Nurses, doctors, surgeons, you know, people who actually do useful shit. My fucking useless ass. I am, what am I going to fucking do? Am I going to fucking try and go a zombie or something? No, I'm useless in the grand scheme of things. So I'm not going to like pretend like I'm the most important person in the world. I'm not. I want people to enjoy themselves get the rough outline of things and then as time goes on we'll pick it up it's not a problem so i suppose the just to kind of really nail that down we have to remember the demographic of the sport and not everyone is like a 20 something year old who has no life they've got like a part-time job and a burning desire to go to like the worlds or adcc trials the majority of people just want to enjoy themselves and so our teaching style and how we approach people should also reflect that. You know, we want them to actually enjoy themselves and not say, fuck this, I'm never doing jiu-jitsu ever again. I do get a kick out of all of these jiu-jitsu bros, though, who have kind of convinced themselves that they're like the alpha specimen of the species. And because they're good at jiu-jitsu, they're just a stone-cold killer. I mean, look, I if there ever were an apocalypse, I'm sorry, I don't want to tell these people, but 
jujitsu is easily defeated by a person holding a somewhat jagged rock. Like it's not that hard <laughs> to shut down jujitsu when the other person refuses to play under IBJJF rules, right? Oh. <laughs> You're not the badass that you think you are just because you could pajama grapple. Ah, ref, ref, ah, boy, ah, boy, he's got a knife. Ah, thank you, thank you. No, honestly, it drives me absolutely mad. And I've got to say, I have actually been attacked before. And, you know, knowing jujitsu has been really useful, but also knowing how to strike knowing how to maintain distance and also most importantly knowing how to stay calm under pressure has been really really important for me so i think that's an important thing to know knowing how to stay composed the psychological aspect of it has been important what is not important is ending up on your back in the middle of a street fight that is like hysterically bad because i actually ended up imagining to bring the guy to the floor and I remember thinking, okay, I've got my hooks and I've got my four points. And then I, I suddenly realized, oh shit, I'm in the middle of a street fight and I'm on my back. This is monumentally bad. He has a friend. His friend could like kick me in the head or stab me or something. And, you know, at one point I was actually threatened with getting stabbed. So at that point, again, I realized jiu-jitsu is actually in some elements not a fucking good idea. So yeah, um, your mileage may vary. Well, I think that, you know, this is another great example, too, of keeping in touch with what your goals are. And I think it is easy for jujitsu geeks like us to get so into the reads about chasing the meta and, you know, what's working at the highest levels of competition that sometimes we forget the majority of people who come into jujitsu are coming in for specific reasons that probably have nothing to do with gold medals. I've never heard of someone walking into a gym and saying, I've never trained jujitsu before, but I'm here to become an IBJJF gold medalist. I've never heard that in my life. Most people who walk into a gym don't even know what the IBJJF is. People come into a gym because they want to learn how to defend themselves. They want to get in shape. They want to build confidence. The same reasons people get into any martial art. And I think you bring up a great point that you can't achieve any jujitsu goals over the long term unless you can convince people to stay and you can't convince people to stay and be consistent unless they're also enjoying the practice. And as a hobbyist myself, a challenge I have often had is when I talk to coaches, it's very clear that their entire thought process is structured around winning gold medals. And that's all well and good, but that's not why I'm here. That's not why a lot of people get into the sport. And that is not at all to say that we should ignore competition and competition doesn't matter. I mean, competition is tremendously important because that's the way that we prove out what works and what doesn't. So even if you don't compete, it's tremendously important because that is basically where the science happens. That's where people go out, they do their experiments and we find out what works and what doesn't. So I'm always grateful to those people. But most people who train aren't coming in with the objective of being the next Gordon Ryan. Most people just want to learn how to not die if they get attacked on the street. And I think sometimes coaches forget that, and that comes across in their expectations with how they communicate with students and the choice of language they use as well. And I mean, I can say myself as someone who trains casually, it is a real turnoff when an instructor very clearly only cares about the 1% of people in the gym who might go on to be high-level competitors when the remaining 99% of us are the ones paying the bills and enabling his lifestyle, right? So that is something that I found challenging is instructors failing to understand the importance of making it fun so that people do come and keep training consistently and don't just drop off. Yeah, I mean, I've got to be honest. I always try and keep in mind that I am incredibly privileged. I worked in the IT industry for over a decade and it was hell on earth, mostly because I was working as an IT or head of IT guy, but in an industry where a majority of people, when it came to technology, were absolute fucking idiots. So my days were generally pretty stressful. And so I always try and remember those days so that when I go to teach, when I have little frustrations, I always remember, actually, you know what? I am really, really fortunate. These people who come and give me their time and money, like... I should be looking after them. I should be shaking all their hands and saying, thank you for making me not have to have a regular job. I get to wake up at like 9 a.m., 9.30 a.m., Steve. I get to have a lion. That's how good my life is. I get to like fucking stay up 
and you know talk absolute shit in podcasts my life is wonderful sorry i just got to ask you when you say you get to have a lion is that like some scottish thing meaning you get to sleep in or do you actually have a lion because this is jujitsu oh, no, no. so if you if you had a pet lion i honestly i'm not sure i'd be surprised <laughs> no 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 i mean it's too cold over here for them no sorry a lion as in i get to sleep in i get to not uh, there's some days i even get to not set an alarm steve that's how lucky i am so you know, I bear that in mind. And I always remember, I think I was in my early 20s and I was helping my coach, you know, teach one of the kickboxing classes. I remember saying to him, there's this guy, he only comes in like once a week, if even that. He barely shows up. Man, he's not going to get any far. He's not going to get anywhere. He's he's not learning stuff. And my coach took me to one side and said, Giles, you're an idiot. This guy has like no time and he uses what little time he has to come and pay a membership and learn from us like you should be giving him as much effort as possible like cram as much information and help and assistance into this guy whilst he's here because he has no fucking time and yet he chooses to use what little time he has and his money to come to me and to you so you know take that as a massive compliment the massive compliment is and you know look after them and that really changed my perspective as you say there's always going to be the high level people the people who are just naturals people who are gifted who are going to you know go on a tear but they don't pay the bills they don't pay the rent it's the regular everyday folk who are just coming to get a little bit fitter take up a new hobby or you know find something that's social and something that they can actually enjoy they're the ones that you really have to look after. You can look after the the naturals will look after themselves. They'll train they'll end up training themselves anyway. But you have to spend your time with the hobbyists and give them your time and your effort. Especially the ones who are really struggling. Those are the ones you should be focusing on. Because you I think you're only as good as your weakest student. If you have like a club that's got maybe five phenoms, but everyone else is absolute dog shit and doesn't know what they're doing, you failed. That's my opinion on it. Yeah, I agree completely. And, you know, I think it's also important for people to understand one of the great things about jujitsu, it's not that it can turn a an already good athlete into an MMA champion. And honestly, that's probably not even the best way to get there if that is your goal. But the power of jujitsu is that it can turn a non-athletic non-violent person into someone who is reasonably capable of defending themselves. I mean, the ability to go from like zero to seven in jujitsu out of 10, you know, that's really where the power is, is that it can turn people who aren't skilled warriors into people who can reasonably defend themselves. They can have the confidence in knowing that they can defend themselves. That's the power of it. I mean, I think people get way too concerned about what's happening at the top level and they forget that For most of us, that's not the standard that we're applying ourselves to. It's more about hitting our own personal goals rather than trying to be some crazy world champion, right? Now, that said, again, I don't take away from that. I acknowledge the importance of that. But my point is that most instructors just kind of miss the mark, I think, in terms of how they target their clientele. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fair to say that a lot of jiu-jitsu instructors, I think a lot of jiu-jitsu instructors can't really see the wood for the trees sometimes, as in they'll obviously teach all their students and they'll give them they'll try and give them the equal amount of time but they'll always pick favorites and everyone is guilty of it we always have our favorites however you have to kind of realize as a coach you know you can have to step back and say okay am i giving too much of my time to someone am i actually looking after the people who need looked after you know how do i make sure that everyone in my club advances how do i make sure that i look after everyone equally because that you know, as best I can. So that's when you start thinking about, okay, how do I keep in touch with people? How do I check in with people? This is where it gets into the more social side of things, into making sure that people in your club actually feel like, well, number one, you actually know their name, you know their face. And I suppose ultimately, you have to make people feel like you give two fucks about them. I think that's something that's really difficult to do as a coach and a lot of people struggle with. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, I think that might just come down to lack of perspective. The coach who has decided to devote their entire professional life to jujitsu is going to have a very different understanding of the sport from someone who just does this once or twice a week for fun. And I think that is one area where coaches kind of, they make that decision at their own peril and they risk losing a lot of people and also not really maximizing the benefits of a sport like jujitsu. 
you talked about lessons that we could learn from a lot of the other sports. And I have been very impressed when I talk to wrestling coaches or people from other walks of life with the way that they think about these things. A lot of what we've already talked about are things that are considered common knowledge in other places. And and I agree with you completely that that kind of perspective for a coach is tremendously important and making sure that you can provide the right assistance to people at those phases. Again, if you are teaching a class to beginners and you're showing them weird, obscure techniques they're probably never going to use, what are you really doing there? Whereas most people would probably benefit more from some simple games that just get them some reps in jujitsu adjacent positions, right? I think for many people, that's kind of the better thing to do. Yeah, actually, that leads quite neatly on to kind of how you sort of want to deal with beginners. This kind of ties back into what I was saying earlier about how you have to, you know, You've got to make sure that everyone goes home with something. Kind of like, you know, when you go to a kid's party and everyone gets a little party bag to take home. I routinely say that in my classes and no one fucking laughs and it breaks my heart. (laughs) I have a young child, so I definitely see the appeal there. By the way, those little goodie bags, fucking expensive. Unbelievable how much money you can sink on those things. It's quite the racket. I mean, Steve, this is part of the reason why I'm never having kids. Like, (laughs) apart from the fact, I'd be a terrible father. I mean... Steve, honestly, I have so many little hang-ups and... No, they're very expensive. Those party bags, having a kid in general is so expensive. I mean, Christ, I've got a dog and two cats. And you know what? It's almost the same. The food's expensive. Taking them to the vet is expensive. Christ, I get the early morning wake-up calls. I mean, sometimes having a cat meowing from 4 a.m. until like 8 a.m., that's like having a kid. It's exactly the same. Actually, I do yeah. have a cat. I think cat people who don't own cats can't appreciate how obnoxious it is when those little shit bags start screaming at you at 3 or 4 a.m. in the morning because they want you to wake up so you can feed them. Oh, absolute bastards. I mean, I love them. They're getting a bit on now. They're 16 years old, our two cats. But between those and then we've got the dog, he's 13. It's honestly, I feel like Dr. fucking Doolittle. I'm fucking up in the morning. I haven't take one of my fish shit. That one's meowing at me, loudly demanding food, and then makes it clear not happy with food. One of them's throwing up a hairball. The other <laughs> one's waking up my partner. It's like, Jesus fucking Christ, can I not get some sleep in this fucking place? So, and Christ, imagine that, but like with a kid, then you've got, you know, then you've got the kid for life. You know what I mean? Oh, I couldn't do it. I mean, I all I know is that when I grew up, I started apologizing to my parents and saying, you know what? I get it. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry for what I've done to you. <laughs> they said, no, no, you were fine. I said, no, don't lie to me. Don't soften the blow. I was an asshole as a kid. <laughs> I see it now. Please <laughs> let me apologize. You know, one of the main benefits to jujitsu is that If you enroll your kid, you can basically offload them and make them someone else's problem for about an hour, which is the most valuable thing that you can get as a parent is just an hour of sanity. I mean, Steve, this is part of the reason why I've not started a kid's class yet, because I just (laughs) live in absolute abject terror of what would happen. When I used to teach kickboxing alongside my instructor, there was like kids who would come in and, you know, like the smallest kids, they'd be okay. You'd know it'd be chaos, but it'd be fine. It'd be like 30 minutes of them running around and maybe occasionally hitting a pad. That's fine. Then you get to slightly older kids, maybe one or two assholes, but the rest of them, you know, they would get into it. Then you get the teenagers, and like half of them, it's just like, you could not wait until you started sparring with them, so you could go like, what's up? And you know, but <laughs> no, no. It's like, come here, look, come here, young man. I actually, we've actually got a few junior students at the club, so we don't have like a kids program or anything for that, but we do have a few students who are like 15 to 17 years old. And every once in a while, myself and our coaches have to say, here, you're getting a bit too big for your britches. You think you're a big man in town? Come here and then, you know, we get to roll them for seven minutes and remind them who the boss is. The problem is we're teaching them too well and they're learning too fast. So now they're just, eventually it's going to flip. And at some point, as I get older and more injured and decrepit, they're going to just start absolutely stunting on me. So yeah, it's kids fuck them not even once oh i've had that happen we had this kid that we trained with and you know a year passes and then a year passes and then a year passes and i'm just getting older and slower and he's getting bigger and stronger and man it's there is definitely that inflection point where one day the student becomes the master (laughs) 
<laughs> so, oh, so you got to make sure that you tap those kids as many times as possible before that happens so that you can always lord that over them no matter how good they get. Oh yeah, there's actually one of the kids, he's, he's brilliant, he's an absolute sponge for knowledge and he competes quite a lot as well. He took me down with a double leg takedown, it was a really sweet setup, I was super impressed, but I then had to get one back, I was like, alright son, that's it, you've opened the door now, is that, I get to be an asshole now, it's like, come on then, and then um, I obviously I launched him, just to remind him, but I know as time goes on, he's just going to absolutely stomp me, so as you say, I'm getting my digs in now, and so I could just remind him, you know, remember at one time, maybe about 15 years ago, where I absolutely launched you and you nearly went out the window? Yeah, remember that, son. Remember your who your elders and betters are. So, Steve, you actually talked about using games and all that to make it easier for people who aren't, like, naturally born gifted athletes like Tyne and Dalper and all that. I actually have a similar sort of approach with beginners, especially if they're kind of clumsy or awkward or if they can't handle a lot of information. And... I actually have quite, I've actually got a few examples of things I commonly do with people, if you're interested in any of them. I mean, it could be like swapping pogs here, Steve, if you remember pogs back in the day. I sure do. You know, I'm waiting for pogs to make a comeback, man, one of these days. But yeah, I would absolutely love to hear that. Let's get some specific examples in here. So if you're a coach, or actually for that matter, if you're a student as well, and you want to simplify your practice, but make it equally or even more effective, how would you go about doing that? Obviously, you still need people to learn their ABCs. This is a closed guard, this is an open guard, yada, yada, yada. But I think one of the easiest things to explain to beginners is actually open guard. So with open guard, I keep it really simple. If we're looking to pass the open guard, I will say, okay, the person is going to not want you to lay on top of them. That is bad for them. I usually won't take that tone because I don't want people to think I'm insulting them, generally speaking. But I'll say to them, okay, the person's on their back and they're trying to use their hands and their feet to keep you the fuck away from them. And I do swear during my classes. And then I'll say the person on top is looking to get past the legs and the hands and go flat on top of the person. You're looking to put your chest on top of theirs. That's as simple as it gets. So in terms of the games I'll get people to play, it's dead simple. Like the dirty feet drill, for example, is okay. I'll start off with the person is on their back, their feet are in front of you. Person at the bottom, keep the feet facing your partner or even better, on your partner. Person who's standing, I want you to grab the ankle slash feet and keep them the fuck away from you. Just keep them away from you at all times. If they're facing you or touching you, you fucked up. That's it. And I'll start with that. And I'll start talking about, okay, You've managed to grab the feet if you're looking to pass. Try and walk a little bit around the feet. Try and get them facing away from you. It's like, okay, Grant, can you now get to the point where you can get your chest close to theirs or put your knee close to their chest? Anything where you can get closer to their chest. That's a sort of set of drills I use, for example, when I'm first teaching open guard passing to students. And then the kind of converse of that if it's open guard retention, I'll say, okay, someone's going to try and grab a hold of your legs and they're going to try and pass you. If someone is grabbing you and you're not at least grabbing them, that is bad. Grab what's grabbing you. Even better, grab what's grabbing you and make sure it can't grab you anymore. So this applies to not just kind of open guard or a lot of forms of guard, but also standing grappling. If someone's got a hold of both your hands, they're probably going to set up something like a double leg, maybe set up an arm drag or something like that, or if it's judo, if they have both your sleeves, then you're going to get fucking launched. But if you can go, no, I'm going to grab what's grabbing me, I'm going to spoil their grips, you're probably not going to get immediately launched. So basic ideas like that, and that kind of leads into stuff where I'll talk about from all positions, everything from your guards to turtle, for example. A common problem with turtle that I find with people is that they kind of just ball up and they do nothing when in actual fact they should be going okay i don't want to stay here for any longer than i have to is someone trying to you know dig in and get an underhook in are they trying to get waist control are they trying to go for my neck or my collar can i grab that hand can i keep that hand yes i can and then start building back out to get the fuck out so that's some specific examples going from open guard passing to open guard retention to you know all that this idea of grit fighting like fuck applies to 
there's so many different areas of the game, both in terms of defence and offence, standing or seated or defending or attacking it. I think that's the, the first one I really try and impart to my students. The second thing I've been telling people to do for probably about five years now, and half of them still don't listen, is underhooks. So generally speaking, if you can get an underhook on your partner, you have a pretty good shot at getting control because the underhook, generally speaking, allows you to get control of their shoulders. And if we're talking about a passing situation or a pinning situation, if you get an underhook, especially on both sides, your partner's probably fucked because their shoulders are being controlled. The same if you're standing, if, you know, all things been equal, if you've got both underhooks and your head posture is not totally screwed, you probably have a chance to take your partner down. Unless, you know, they've got far superior standing grappling to you. But I think breaking this thing down to the basic sort of easy to remember phrases that you can yell at them whilst they're drilling, I think that's really useful, especially as people start out or if people are struggling to comprehend what they're meant to be doing. I've had people before in a few of my classes who've gotten quite flustered and are like, I'm completely rudderless, Giles. I don't know what I'm doing. So I always scale it back. I say, okay, don't worry about the technique and all the rest of it. Just focus on what you're, at the end of the day, what you're trying to do. What, in the abstract, what is your high level goal? So you're in the bottom. The other person here is trying to pin your shoulders to the mat. That's their win condition. You cannot let that happen. Put shit in the way. I don't care if it's your foot, your shin. I don't care if you're using voodoo. You bribe them. I don't know, maybe you've got your wallet on you and you throw money at them. I don't care how you do it. Just keep them the fuck away from you. And do not let both your shoulders get pinned to the mat. I think, especially for people who are struggling a little bit or for beginners, or if they're competing and, you know, their blood's up, um, it's noisy, they're traumatized because it's a, you know, it's triggered their fight or flight response. You have to make it these things which are easy to comprehend, something which will stick in their head and they'll go, oh, well, that's an easy enough instruction. Just put something in the way. I've got something I can put in the way. I can do that. Okay. They're no longer passing my guard. Oh shit, I should go for the underhook. I should go for the underhook because Giles has told me that a million times. Oh, I need to grip fight. They're gripping me. That is bad. I'm going to have to grip fight. So I think taking those sort of things and really sort of trying to hammer that home and giving the jolts to do that is a big part of what you should be doing with beginners or if someone's really struggling with certain aspects of jiu-jitsu. Absolutely. I have more examples that you want, Steve. Well, yeah, let's get into those. But first I can just maybe dig in a little bit to some of the things that you talked about. I agree with you entirely your, on your statements about grip fighting. I've said on this podcast before many times that grips dictate position. Very common mistake people make is they will get so focused on trying to quote unquote do a technique that they will ignore the status of the grip game. You'll see this all the time with beginners where they will aggressively try to pass someone's guard when they're, they've lost the grip fight. And this usually results in them getting collar dragged or swept or something bad happening. And I agree with you in terms of how to deal with that. I always advise people, if someone grabs you, you have to find a way to invert that grip so that they don't have control anymore. I guess it's worth pointing out that not all grips are scary. Sometimes your opponent has a grip on you that's just useless and you learn to understand and feel that as you get more experienced. But if your opponent has a dominant grip on you where they can actually control your movement and they can control the distance as well, that you have to deal with before you try to advance. And yes, there's really three ways that you can do that. One way is you can just straight up break the grip like a judoka would. I'm not a big fan of grip breaking. I find it's very attribute based and it's hard on everyone's fingers. Also, while you're focused on breaking a grip, the other person can just move on to the next stage of their game too while you're distracted. So I like doing what you talked about, which I've always called just inverting the grip. So if someone's got a good grip on you, swim your hand to the inside and grab them back. Um, or alternately, sometimes you can just change the angle of your body so that that grip just isn't useful anymore. This comes up a lot when you're on top and the person is trying to grab you on the bottom. Sometimes the most efficient thing, rather than trying to break or invert the grip, is just to cut an angle, change your body's configuration so that grip doesn't help anymore. That is a very important thing. And again, in terms of where gamification can help people, for most people, if you're having trouble either maintaining guard or if you're having trouble passing guard, Rather than getting too obsessive about trying to find the best guard passing technique or the best guard retention technique, 
probably better for you to set up some games and focus on your grip fighting. This is one of my favorite games to work on with people and to coach people through is grip fighting only. Kind of you go towards someone's guard and both of you jockey for dominant grips. As soon as someone gets dominant grips, game's over and you reset and you go again. You're not doing actual jujitsu moves. You're just practicing hand fighting because if you can, especially in the gi man, if you can win the grip fight battle, you're probably going to be the one who gets to dictate what happens from there on out. I actually do similar things with open guard retention. So because I'm relatively bendy, I should say flexible, I prefer a lot of open guard stuff. So I play a lot of CC guards. I'm heavily inspired by lack on Giles. And one of the things I get people to do whenever I'm teaching open guards is I get them to work on maintaining distance and frames. So it's basically just scooting around and it seems like nothing, but making it so that a per- that you can manage distance and stop them from stepping in or stepping in between your legs or stepping to the outside of your legs unless you want to. I find that's an invaluable skill as well. Like managing distance obviously is important, but moreover making sure that you limit the amount of moves they have or limit their attacking options, I think is also important. So that's how I've approached it from that angle. But obviously, grip fighting is really important as well. And I would say grip fighting is one of the first things that people should learn. Uh, I sometimes even make it a warm-up, depending on what topic I'm going to teach. Because so many people uh, just don't learn the importance of grip fighting, nullifying grips, taking counter grips. I was quite lucky in that my first jiu-jitsu coach was a really good judo black belt. So I learned how to deal with certain grips, how to counter, how to deal with it if I couldn't break it, which I couldn't because I'm 67 kilos soaking wet. What's that in freedom units? I don't know. I'm not American. I'm also on the uh, superior metric system too. So it's not just you. Oh yes, of course. And that's just one of many sort of games. But again, these games should all serve, just going back to previous things I talked about, this should all serve to impress upon people the basic concepts or the most basic ideas and things they should be worrying about. Well, not worrying about, because that implies an element of fear of all, you know, as uh, just I suppose there's always fear involved. But I think one of the most important things for me that I've really been emphasizing recently is the whole don't be flat thing. So, for example, anytime you're in side control, if you get both your shoulders pinned to the mat or if you're in half guard, bottom, or, you know, even if you're playing open guard, if both your shoulders are flat in the mat, it limits your offensive and defensive capabilities. And I think one of the instances where this became most apparent was ADCC East Coast Trials. I think that was last year, where you saw so many people. And there was It was quite wrestling this time around, especially in the lower weight classes. But you saw so many people, the moment it hit the deck, the moment their back and their backside hit the deck, they were fighting like hell to not have both shoulders in the mat. They were instantly one shoulder off the mat, you know, the floor is lava. They were constantly looking to pop up, scramble up to their knees. And impressing that upon students, I think, is a skill that contributes in both the offensive and defensive sides. So, for example, what I'll get them to do, what I'll get students to do in so many different positions, and this goes to the top and the bottom person, is, for example, half guard. I'll say to them, okay, We've worked a little bit on half guard being knee shields. We've done some work on the butterfly half guard as well. The goal of the person on top is to try and pin both your shoulders to the mat for three seconds. Person at the bottom, I've given you all the tools. Like, I don't care how you do it, but do not let them pin both your shoulders to the mats for three seconds. So working on that premise and then advancing on stuff like making sure your partner get, get chest to back off of certain positions and then addressing other topics like for example side control so for me side control the big thing that makes that work is making sure you've got side to side motion and that's something i've been trying to sort of teach my students in the past month or so where i've said okay at its most basic level if you're stuck in side control and both your shoulders up into the mat that's like the absolute worst case scenario a well, apart from getting strangled your first goal should therefore be trying to get one shoulder off the mat I don't care if you're taking preach material, like, so hawking, baby bridge perhaps. I don't care if you run to turtle. I don't care how you do it, but one shoulder's got to come off the mat. So obviously there's various ways of doing that. I will tell the person to talk, for example, to not take grips or lock their hands. And I'll say to the person at the bottom, okay, 
you've got a rough idea of what you're doing. Your goal is to try and get one shoulder off the mat and keep it off the mat for three seconds. You do that, that's a win condition. Person top, you're just trying to maintain side control, but you cannot lock your hands together. No specific examples in games will impress upon people. Okay, generally speaking, if I'm flat my shoulders, I'm fucked. I do not want to be flat. And then when I translate that across to open guard, I say to people, okay, we've worked, your partner's worked a lot in leg drags, leg weaves, so on and so forth. Those kind of passes. Those passes become a little bit easier if you're completely flat on your back, both shoulders in the mat. Therefore, you should be looking to at least be rounding your back and being more engaged with your grip fight. Again, going back to the, the whole grip fight thing, that's really important. But also, you need to make sure that you're actively trying to put barriers in the way. So again, that's not kind of open guard, you know, trying not to get passed by putting barriers in the way. But also, going onto one side, that kind of sideways tilt is something that a lot of people talked about what well, first became apparent to me last year, or early last year, that the side tilt was a really good idea. It was something that you kind of already do anyway. You know, you play call and sleeve. You're already kind of on one side anyway. But then people explicitly said, no, actually being on your side makes it a bit easier for you to keep defensive tools in front of the person and to block stuff off. For example, you've got stuff like the sideways open guard or variations very off that Preet's talked about. That relies on you being sideways on and being posting your elbow. But that then gives you more options in terms of not getting immediately passed. You can fight off a lot of things. Whereas if you're flat on your back, both your shoulders on the mat, your defensive and offensive capabilities are limited. So in all this sort of spectrum, in all these different areas, general rule of not being absolutely flat on your back, don't have both shoulders on the mat. I think that's a really good sort of thing using various drills you can impress upon people and that they'll be able to carry through throughout jiu-jitsu. It's funny that you brought up Preet Mikkelsen because he actually taught me an idea that I found very helpful for this. I don't know the name for it, so I've always just called it Preet's 45-degree rule. I've got it in our database, actually. I wrote up and tried to explain how it works, but what he told me was, if your opponent has killed your legs, so if they passed your guard generally is what that means, then you want your body to be at a 45-degree angle to the floor. What you don't want is both of your shoulders pinned to the mat, but also you probably don't want to be at a 90 degree angle to the floor either because that's Kimura armbar territory. So what Preet said was once someone has passed your legs, you want to be at a 45 degree angle. And often that means you're kind of at a tilt. You've got one shoulder up, one shoulder down. And that's a, a much stronger way to attack from because you can't really get pinned as easily, right? You never want to be both shoulders to the mat looking up. You never want to be belly down because the person can dominate you there. And being straight perpendicular is risky too because of the arm locks. So I like this idea of, okay, if they get past my legs, I want to focus on 45 degree angles. A lot of that is mostly applicable to playing the guard as well. But there are some exceptions, especially in the gi. There are guards you can play where if you've got the person tied up enough, you can go supine and put your shoulders on the mat. But all the same, most of the time in the guard, you still probably don't want to have your shoulders down on the mat. If you're going to be down on your side, you usually will want to be tilted unless you're in one of those very specific guards, maybe where you've got control of their sleeves and you've pulled them on top of you. And you're getting a lot of push-pull leverage with your hand grips and your feet. In those cases, you can get away with it. But I really found this rule to be helpful to know what to do when you're getting dominated from side control or a bad position. Just knowing that you want to be at 45-degree angles relative to the mat was really helpful. Just a, a quick thing to remember that I learned from Preet. Well, I would say that's a really good rule, and I do apply that myself. I've um, been able to go to camps and sort of learn from Preet and kind of pick his brains about things. But I would say for beginners... Again, this is where we have to always think of our demographic and think of who we're looking after. If I tell people to start breaking out the compass and the protractor and the graph paper, they're going to look at me and say, uh-uh, I don't fucking think so, mate. I'm not here to do maths again. I hate Pythagoras. So just, I think, giving them simple directives and then saying, don't worry about the, the finer details. As things go on, we will we'll pick it up. This is why I try and give them the direct as simple as possible. For example, if they're in a competition and say it's a white belt competition and I see them clearly, oh shit, they've gone flat a bit. All right, you know, don't be pinned to the floor. 
don't be flat, being flat equals death, get a shoulder. And then what I try and add to that is I try and add to, you know, start moving your hips away. And generally speaking, if you're in side control or in the bottom, your options are not that vast at the end of the day. It's either going to be regarding or it's going to be coming to your knees. And coming to your knees will either be some form of dogfight or it'll be turtling, some variation thereof. Whereas regarding, it's generally going to be speaking, putting a leg, if not both legs in front, and then trying to move your hips away. But in all scenarios, it starts off with not being flat on the floor and then ultimately trying to move your hips away from the person a little bit so they're no longer controlling your hips. Because if your hips are completely free to move, then you do have more defensive options or escape options. But the way I see it is if you're in the bottom, pinned in the bottom in a bad spot, like side control, you're generally speaking looking to, as I say, not be flat and then try and move the hips away if you can. And you could argue it's the same with mount. Again, if you're completely flat and you give up that elbow space, so you're letting them isolate one of your arms and put it next to your head, then you're turbo fucked. Whereas if you can keep your elbows close and then try and get to your side, maybe look to hip escape, maybe look to do any more manner things like replace quarter mount or get the quarter guard or start working into that, kip and escape. It all starts with not being completely flat or not having your shoulders pinned in the mat. So I always try and break it back down to bare bones basics. And then from there, as time goes on, I can give more details to students who said, all right, Jazz, I understand the whys. The whys are the scaffolding. I am now ready to build, build, build. And I think that's where concepts and systems interconnect quite neatly. Once a student says, I now understand why I'm doing all this, the why has given me the ability to take on this extra information and this detail and build my own system or understand what I'm doing. I think that's the kind of interconnection, if that makes sense, Steve. Totally makes sense. Yeah, I think that that's a very powerful way to look at the relationship between concepts and techniques. Concepts are kind of the foundation. They're the things that everything else is built on top of. I like to look at techniques as really nothing more than an example of concepts in action. If you go at things trying to memorize techniques, then you're inevitably going to wind up in a situation where you just don't have the right technique for a job. It would be like going to, into a math exam and rather than trying to learn how to do the calculations, to try to memorize what the right answers are for any individual question. You can't do that because you probably don't know what questions are going to be on the exam. So the only way you can pass an exam is if you understand the concepts. If you're just trying to memorize questions and answers, that's not going to work. Similarly, in jujitsu, if you're just trying to memorize techniques and responses, you'll always find a situation comes up that you just haven't foreseen. Or additionally, maybe you will be trying to do techniques, but there's just too much stuff going on in your head and you can't think fast enough because you're trying to remember too many steps. So I always think that the best way to understand this relationship between concepts and techniques is the concepts are the things that are just generally the ideas that are most of the time going to be true and they're very simple and they don't really tell you what exactly you have to do technique wise, but they just give you guidance on good ways to manage your body and, you know, countermanage your opponent. And then from there, once someone really understands this and they can almost instinctually apply those concepts like you brought up, for example, going for underhooks is someone once they instinctually understand the differences between going for the inside, going for the outside, when you would do what, why those work, when they don't work, then it starts making sense to say, OK, show me that exact technique. Then you can give me the steps. Show me how you do it with the understanding that that's just an example. It's just a data point. It's not a rule that you have to do the technique the same way, but it's just an expression of those concepts in action. Yeah, I mean, actually, that's a very good point, Steve. I should note that there are actually no real rules in jiu-jitsu. Well, well, apart from, like, you know, wash your gi, don't be a creep. So those are rules, obviously, that people should really be following. But when it comes to jiu-jitsu principles and concepts, these are observations based on what works. And sometimes things happen which breaks them. Therefore, I would say that you cannot have an absolute in jiu-jitsu. You cannot say this will always work 100% of the time. This concept can never be broken. It's all just like observational laws. Like, for example, there's certain like laws of physics that are observational. 
we cannot empirically prove that these are always valid and can never be broken. Right? Same with jujitsu. We can say to someone, okay, generally speaking, it's a good area to get underhooks. But there are times where you hunt for an underhook, but it's a shit underhook. Your partner's got a strong wizard or overhook. And then, for example, if you're standing grappling, they can launch you with Uchimata, for example. Or they might be able to get a Dars on you. So there's times where it's not a rule. It's just a really strong idea or concept or principle or something you should look for. But there's always caveats. So before someone says, oh, well, what about this scenario? You're not considered. This is not a rule. You are wrong. You know, I'm just kind of heavily caveating and save and basically covering your backside as well, Steve, in case someone comes for us and says, oh, well, you're wrong. You've not considered this scenario. I'm just going to throw you under the bridge if someone comes for you. I'm going to say this. <laughs> the Scottish guy held me hostage and just spouted off all of this crazy shit. I don't necessarily agree with it. No, but in this case, you're completely right. The map is not the territory. There are very few firm, universal, always true laws in jujitsu. And that's an important thing to understand. This is part of the reason why I prefer the terminology mental models as opposed to rules or principles or laws. I don't like to talk in that kind of absolute because there are very few absolute rules like that in jujitsu. So sometimes people call something a rule, like, you know, the 80-20 rule. It's not even really a rule. It's just more of a guidepost. It's important to understand that in jujitsu, there's so much variability that there are very few things that are universal rules. I mean, you brought up a good one there, right? Like wash your gi. Even that's not a universal rule. There's people who train in, in no gi only, right? So, so it doesn't apply to them. So there's always going to be a counter example. Very, very few things are just absolutely, completely, 100% percent always true and that especially applies in something like jujitsu so this is an area where i think a lot of coaches they maybe fail to communicate this properly to their students i certainly was under the impression when i started jujitsu that many of the things my coaches were telling me to do were meant as universal rules and maybe they were honestly maybe my coaches were just wrong but as i get more and more experienced i realize there are precious few rules in jujitsu that always apply you brought up underhooks versus overhooks that's a great example if you go back and listen to early episodes of this podcast i used to always tell people go for the inside channel right like go for underhooks try to get between their legs I love that kind of jujitsu, right? You get in close, you make it a close range fight, you take away their movement options. That's the kind of jujitsu that I do. But I can't deny that there are very high level grapplers who play a lot of outside control. I don't necessarily know if I would be good at it. I have a suspicion that it might require uh, certain attributes to pull that off. But there's a lot of people who go around the outside. They go for overhooks. They try to hook outside the leg. They spin around to take the back. And all of that stuff clearly is valid. But I would say in all else being equal, if you're ever in a position and you don't know what to do, if your body shape is kind of like most people's, then probably if you don't know what to do, going for the inside is always a good idea, <laughs> right? So that's another perfect example of something that just, it's not a rule, but it is a very important thing to understand because look, in the heat of the moment, if someone is attacking you and they're going a hundred miles an hour and you don't have time to think about what technique you want to pull out of the bag next, understanding that at least getting an underhook is probably going to be a good thing. That's really going to help simplify your decision-making process if you don't have a better plan. Yeah. I mean, I think you used the term analysis paralysis earlier and that is so true. I remember someone in my old career once said to me, Giles, sometimes a bad decision is better than no decision. And sometimes you just have to take a shot at things. If you just stay and do nothing and you're in a bad spot, then you know you're doomed. Sometimes the the prospect of absolute death versus a fairly certain chance of death, you're going to take the fairly certain chance of death. You know, neither option is good, but you're going to take the option which is least shit. So telling people, you know, at the end of the day, there's caveats, you might go wrong, but it's better than doing nothing. Absolutely correct there and um i would say that people talk about you know my style my game and all that everyone always talks about they have a style of doing things i think this is where this is a difficult thing for instructors to do you have to learn to delegate and ultimately you have to give students the tools to look outside the gym so this is something i've learned over the years i've learned that i've got a style of jiu-jitsu i've got five other coaches to teach at the gym who've got their own way of doing things, their own temperament, their own backgrounds. 
But I regularly say to students, like, do not copy us. Especially, do not copy me. It's the worst thing you could do. Like, you have to, we, our goal is to give you the whys to help you understand ultimately what the game is to help you figure out, okay, this is what I'm trying to do. And then from there, we're trying to equip you to then seek the answers yourself. I cannot give you, basically when people get to like purple belt, they should at that point be really self-directed learn. White belt and blue belt, the training wheels are still on. But after that, really, ideally, they should be self-studying going, okay, Giles and other coaches have given me they've given me an understanding of the kind of concepts or what makes jiu-jitsu or what makes grapple work. I have a pretty decent understanding now. I know when I'm in these various positions up and down. I know my ABCs. You know, I want to find something which suits my temperament, something that suits my game. I find that I myself in this position a lot. I enjoy this position. Who plays that position a lot? Giles doesn't play it. None of our coaches play it. I'm going to find someone else. And some coaches get really protective and really pissy about that. I am the exact opposite. Like, my job is to get to people to a point where they have the aha moment, they understand it, and then they can go off on their own and explore and figure it out. And routinely, I have students come back and say, Giles, I was watching this video, or I was sharing with this person, and I did this cool thing, or they came to me with this cool idea, and I go, huh. You know, there's actually a few times I go, oh, that's actually pretty interesting. I will take that and use that in my own training. There's a few times I've kind of had to say to students, you've sent me an Instagram video of someone doing some 20-step bullshit, which will never work. <laughs> Please do not do this, especially do not try it in a competition. <laughs> but, you know, I have like a couple of students who, God bless them, I think they send it to me simply to upset me. They go, ha, I'm going to send some bullshit fucking arm lock. That will not work in anyone unless they're dead and or, you know, <laughs> in a wheelchair maybe. But I do have so many students who say, I've been to this camp, I've learned this, and, you know, I could uh, put it into my game. And I'll usually give them the thumbs up and say, that's fucking legit. You know what I mean? There's, you know, there's so many different ways to do things. You find a way that works for you. It is logically sound. It works under pressure. Fucking go with it. Like, you don't have to copy me. Like, you shouldn't be copying me. And again, just to reiterate, I think that more coaches need to kind of be of that mindset. Like, you help them get to a point and then you let them go and play. And then that's it. And you don't try and go, no, no, no. I brought you into this world. I can take you out of it. You don't be possessive of people. That's so stupid and it stifles people. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Also, unfortunately common in jujitsu. But I think that the more that people speak up about that and give that nuance, I think the easier it is for students to understand that you shouldn't be married to your instructor. Your instructor is not the single source of truth. There will be limits to what they know. There's so much jujitsu that I don't even have a clue about. I mean, a lot of the stuff that even people would consider fundamentals these days, a lot of those things I just don't integrate to my game because they don't interest me. I mean, particularly a lot of sleeve-based stuff. It just, I don't really play it. Now that said, there are black belts out there who can do amazing things with sleeve control and but for me that just isn't my game as long as i'm able to shut it down and do the kind of jujitsu that i want to do i'm happy with that and so i think that everyone no matter how good they are there will be limits to their knowledge and there may also be limits and problems with the way they present the knowledge they do have so I think understanding your coach is human too, and having a, a broad source of information, not just getting everything from one person is important. That's also really culty, right? If your instructor expects you to just learn everything from them and only them, usually that's a red flag if that's happening in the gym. Yeah. I mean, I came from a background of traditional martial arts. So I came from karate and then uh, I did like, as I said, ninjutsu. I also did a little bit of kung fu and that was super culty. And uh, I've come out of traditional martial arts and I'm really super jaded. I came out of ninjutsu. I came out of a cult, basically. And then afterwards, I was like, holy shit, never again. So again, it's just this idea, as you said, one person having a monopoly needs to come crashing down. There are, as you say, so many different people who know what they're talking about. And I think this is another thing. I think there's a lot of people who don't know what they don't know. The kind of Dunning-Kruger thing. You got too many 
not just like a white and blue belts and purple belts, but also too many coaches who think, yeah, I can teach that, or yeah, I know what I'm doing. And in actual fact, what you're doing is a disservice to your students. And so you have to sometimes take a long, hard look at what you're doing, your own understanding of a particular topic, and then make a decision and say, no, I cannot explain this in a way that is satisfactory. Like, I would not be happy to try and muddle through this. I will instead point you towards this person or this coach. Like, in my gym, we've got the, the other coaches who teach there. They have things that they've deep dived into. Now, I've been training for six and a half years, so I've got a pretty broad base of knowledge, but there's some areas I have deep dived into more than others, which I will obviously explicitly say to people, you know, these are my jam. These things I really like and I could show you. But there's other things I'll say to people, like, I know it. I understand how it works. I get the mechanics. But if you want to deep dive into it, you need to see that coach. You need to speak to this person. You need to watch these videos. You need to watch tape on this person. And I think if you ultimately want the best for your students, you have to equip them with the understanding of the whys so they can sift out all the bullshit. It's kind of like critical thinking. So, you know, a lot of people nowadays, unfortunately, don't have critical thinking. So when they see like scams or bullshit in the media, they don't have the ability to go, well, hold on a second. That sounds awfully fishy. Who wrote that article? Or, you know, does that actually make sense? Is that true? How have they worded it? It's the same with jiu-jitsu. You have to equip your students with the ability to go, okay, I understand how jiu-jitsu is meant to work. I understand the kind of concepts. I get the whys. I get what I'm trying to approach here. So I know when this person, for example, shows me this technique or comes up with this idea, I know it's probably not, it's probably bullshit. I know that half of the stuff on Instagram or TikTok probably isn't going to fucking work. I've looked at it. I've assessed it. My coach has given me the critical thinking skills to go, nah, that's bullshit. But I also then know, ah, this person's got really good jiu-jitsu. This is a good source of jiu-jitsu I should look at and study more because they suit my game. And that's really our job as coaches. Our job is to like give them the tools they need to learn themselves and really sort of, we've just built the rocket and the launch pad. They're the ones fucking doing all the rest of the work. So we have to empower our students to get to where they're going under their own steam, really. I'm sorry, I crammed like five different analogies into that. That probably makes no fucking sense whatsoever. No, man, you mix all the analogies together and create a super analogy. It's like making a protein <laughs> shake. It's a good thing. We did cover a lot here, though, today, Giles. I want to make sure we tie this up so that you have time to make it to the bagpipe store before they close. <laughs> Is there anything that you wanted to uh, to get into here before we tie this one up? Anything we missed or did we get through it all? No, I think we've covered it. And I mean... I've given you some sort of uh, examples of what I sort of teach students. And I think the main thing I want to sort of go over again once more, just briefly, it's not concepts versus systems. It's concepts and systems. You need to give students the whys and make them understand concepts. So then as they go on, they carry that knowledge through all their learning. And then hopefully eventually one day they go on to teach and they still have all that knowledge with them. So concepts and systems should be working hand in hand. And rather than everyone, you know, being at each other's throat saying ecological is the best, no, you must teach the techniques. And people should be using a mix of both. And we should be more like other sports where they use a mixture of different approaches based on the individual, based who's in the maps and who's in the room to help them become the best they can be. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is help our students be understand things as best they can, go as far as they possibly can, and hopefully enjoy themselves and do it, and not break all the bones in their fucking body as they go about it. And that's our goal as coaches, and um, we should never lose sight of that. So yeah, a mixture of all different approaches, a lot of uh, reflection and introspection on our point, and self-development on ourselves, and uh, we'll do all right. I think that's my uh, sort of, I think that's my main sort of takeaway. I want a nice sort of conciliatory message where I'm not actively having a go at one side or the other. <laughs> Both sides are fine. There we go. Everyone's happy, Steve. Thanks, man. Well, hey, if people want to follow you or send you questions or argue with you about the historical accuracy of Braveheart, how do they go about doing that? Yeah. So my club is called Ronin Grappling. 
And so you can find that on Instagram, Facebook, all the rest of it. I'm also on YouTube. If you search for Giles Garcia, you'll see me, some of my matches, and also my Globetrotter videos work over things. Again, please be warned, if you don't like swearing, then I'm probably not for you. I also have a, a public portal where I put all my videos. And can I put my money where my mouth is? I wanted all my students to get knowledge and ideas and concepts. So I built a video portal for them about a few years ago during the pandemic. And I've got nearly 40 hours of content on there. Even from like match breakdowns to ecological drawing videos to like kind of longer concept videos to like short like collections of like, this is how you do X, Y, Z. All my students get that for nothing, but I've got a publicly available version called BGJ Codex. And um, if people want that, then they can sign up for a free trial and then they can decide if they like it or not. So yeah, that's where you can find me. Um, if you want to call me a prick to my face, come to Glasgow anytime. My gym is in Rutherglen. Please come and say hello. We love visitors. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, Steve, for letting me come on and, and ramble. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no worries, sir. You are most welcome. I'll put those links in the show notes just to make it easy for people. I'll also put a link to our stuff. Everything we make lives at bjjmentalmodels.com. On the free side, getting real close to 300 episodes of this podcast. That's a lot of stuff. It's all intended to be timeless and evergreen. So you should be able to get just as much value out of the stuff from years ago as you do today. And again, all free. So you might as well go get it now. You can also sign up for our newsletter getting close to 10,000 people signed up there. So it's a pretty big one, maybe one of the bigger ones. And that's also free. There's a lot of good stuff on there, including expanded notes on the podcast, thought pieces that we send out every week. Every once in a while too, I throw in a freebie and send people a free instructional if they're subscribed to the newsletter. So get in on that. If you want to take it up to the next level, BJJ Mental Models Premium is how you do it. You go there and you're going to get our entire course library, over 100 hours of master classes on strategy, concepts, tactics, featuring uh, just an amazing slate of guests. Um, Brianna St. Marie's on there, Rafael Lovato Jr., Claudia Duval, John Thomas, just tons and tons and tons. You can hit the website to get a full list of everything we've got. We also have amazing premium podcast material on there in addition to the courses. We've got premium podcasts with uh, Drew Foster, best known as Darce Knight on Reddit. He has an amazing podcast with us called State of the Meta, where he does ongoing meta and competition analysis, kind of as a Coles notes of what's going on in the comp scene. So if like me, you're too lazy to watch everyone else's comp footage, it's a great way to get up to speed. We've also got the highest levels with Emily Kwok, multi-time world champion, and Joe Hannon. And they also have an amazing series of conversations about peak performance. Sometimes they're bringing some big guests. We've actually had uh, Paul Schreiner and Marcelo Garcia on there as guests recently. So definitely recommend people check that stuff out if they haven't already. It's all bundled in. And of course, if you go up to our coaching tier, you also get direct coaching from uh, quite literally some of the best black belts in the world. We've got a slate of world champs who have won a collective 20 or so world championships in there and they're available to break down your match footage give you comp advice even help prep with mindset or ask general questions about how to direct your study all of that's included and it is a fraction of the price that it costs to work with coaches of that caliber directly because of the scale that we operate at we can arrange this at a much much cheaper cost so if you want to get all of that bundled in get the coaching for probably a third or a quarter of what it normally costs get all of that course material bjjmentalmodels.com is where you go to get it and the first week is free so if you hate it no problem you don't have to pay anything um, but i'll put that in the show notes as well alongside all of your stuff giles Thanks so much for coming by, man. This was a fun one. It's been an absolute pleasure. I've got to say, ever since I subscribed to BGJ Mental Models, the premium version last year, it's actually been really useful for me as a coach. There's been so many different resources. The podcasts have been like my number one podcast since I subscribed last year. It's been great for me, not just as a coach, but as a student. Take on these ideas and concepts from the kind of high level people you've had, and it's actually then been reflected in what I'm teaching my students. So it's been so useful in that respect. And um, if they don't take the subscription, then people are missing out, frankly. Thanks, man. I greatly appreciate it. And hey, I appreciate the time too. I always love having uh, new guests on. This is the first time that we've talked, and man, I'm hoping we get to do it again in the future. Yeah, I'd like to do it. I mean, ultimately, Steve, a lot of what I do in my approach changes. I try and travel quite a lot, so I'll travel to train with different people. I'll also travel to the Globetrotters camps or like the ones with Nicky Ryan and stuff like that that he's doing over in Belgium. 
or like Jess and Rowan, all that. And I ingest quite a lot of um, material, even from like your podcast to a few other martial arts podcasts, I'll watch tape and all the rest of it. And I'll try and like, I will try and see if what I'm doing is correct. And I actually have sort of set training sessions with other coaches and things that I do to try and make sure I'm staying top of things. Because I'm 37 years old. I know I'm not going to be a world-class competitor. I was aware of that like nearly a decade ago. I knew my time had kind of, my, the kind of ship had sailed in that one. But what I resolved to do was try and be a better coach. And I've got to say, my teaching style, especially in the past two years, how I approach it, has massively changed for the better. And it's ever since I started really trying to hone in, okay, I've been banging on about concepts and the basic ideas. Let's really try and nail this now. Let's try and figure out how best to get this in students' heads. So I'm hoping, if you want to have me on at some point, I'm hoping next time at some point in the future, I'll have a, a whole host of... Uh, new idioms and, and daft analogies and things I can share with you. Well, thanks, Giles, for coming by, man. Really appreciated this chat. It was a good one. And thanks to all of the listeners as well. We'll talk to you next week. Take care.